are blessed to have with us this morning. Uh, Celso and Andrea Fonseca, they've been with us uh, off and on here for a while. Uh, some of you know they've been here in the United States uh, with their family. Uh, while Leo has been dealing with his illness and things like that, uh, uh, came to welcome him and then to be with him as we've seen some other things happening there. But uh, they've had a, a good opportunity to be here and to uh, just uh, reconnect with their boys and their families and to be blessed there. Uh, but before too long, they're going to be heading back into the mission field. And so uh, Celso, the church has supported him for longer than I've been around here. I don't know how long that's been, but there's been a good gospel relationship that's been ongoing there for a while. And so uh, we uh, continue to support the work they're doing uh, in, in serving the, the cause of the gospel and building God's kingdom around the world. And he's going to be sharing with us this morning some of the things that are coming up in their, in their ministry work. Uh, heading to a new place to go and serve, and so we are not welcome them this morning. And Celso, you come on up. Celso is going to share with us uh, some things that the Lord is doing there. Hello, uh, good day to be here with you uh, today. We have been here in the United States for two months. Because you know, I you know, and you, you are praying. We we thank you for praise for your praise for Leo. Uh, he had a new liver uh, transplant, transplanted um, nine H and nine uh, January. Uh, because I, I remember very well because the H was uh, the birthday of uh, other grandpa the of leo and nine is my birthday so the the surgery started h night and go uh, over to nine uh, january 9th so i i could uh, uh, congratulate uh, my how do you say another grandfather and say today our uh, grandchild is getting a new uh, opportunity to life uh, had a, a new liver so thank you for your praise for us all the family it was a, a time very important for us to be together to pray to uh, all, to worship lord and uh, uh, give you some um, uh, encourage uh, one each other so for um uh excuse me for my english sorry for my english but i will try to uh to be clear if you don't, don't understand you can say oh we we don't understand a, uh, anything that you are <laughs> talking so uh as uh, eric said uh, i'm going to back brazil this uh this thursday thursday and uh, to be a little time with a uh, uh, church in brazil but we are and uh, we stay a little more uh our plans at, at is uh we will meet in march uh we will trip uh together for saint Tomé e principe for uh after pandemic time we are restarting uh the Oral Bible School in Santo Tomé, a principe. It's uh, we always going there for uh, twice a, a year. So after uh, since the pandemic started, we get no, we got no there. So thanks God, uh, I think in the this time we will be there. So uh, it's a good time for people that don't know us. And the, that know the people that know us to get uh, a catch up about you know, our work. So um, it uh, was a uh, 2000 age when Samuel and uh, Daniel was like that. We are going to the first time as a family to Africa. I and Andrea um, were working in Africa in 19 years. But uh, now, as a family, uh, he, they came with us, Samuel and uh, Daniel. So, as you know, 
It is the, the last year picture we, we get together, uh, August. Um, before we know about uh, the, the disease of uh, Leo. And you, we are working for this time, long time, uh, 12 years, uh, yes, 12 years with a full many people. In the, uh, this map, you can see in Africa where the full many people uh, live. So uh, the new work we are going to, to do in Angola uh, is not a, a home, a, a home country for Fulani, but the more and more the, the, the Fulani and the Muslims people from the north of, Af of Africa are going to Angola or South Africa to, to bring uh, their faith. So uh, we, we would like to help the church in Angola how to work with these people because they don't know. They don't know how to talk, how to, to tell about Jesus. Uh, so it's uh, one work we, we do. How you, maybe you know, uh, we have the peoples uh, in the world. So the, we have 1,000. Uh, 11,000 uh, people in the world that 7,000 people are unreached people groups and the 3,165 uh, is the engaged unreached people group it's clear for you? okay so uh, we, we always we talk about Muslims. They are friends that we share Jesus with them. Uh, in the last time, also, we started working with orality. is telling stories of Bible. Uh, is a, it's a method that works very well. That works very well. Uh, we are working that. Like, for example, I... I already uh, shared with you this, but maybe some of you didn't see. Uh, we don't use uh, um, books or uh, notes. Uh, so just we tell the stories in French and in Pular, that's the, their language, and they understand very well. They can also uh, tell the stories after they uh, learn these stories. So we, what we use, you are seeing is the uh, rocks. We uh, each story that you, we uh, shared with them, we put a rock on the floor, and then uh, they uh, they are able to remember what uh, each story, each rock uh, corresponds one story that so like that we we did uh h5 stories of the whole bible so they it is the redem, uh, redemptive story of bible so after it they can understand very well what is the gospel what is the bible what is the god's message so uh it's a why we are working now uh social activities with the children, so you know, Abby was with us, and uh, some healthy uh, works, service, and uh, since 2016, uh, well, 16, yes, 17, we started the Bible School of Pastors. So we had uh, uh, this picture was when the uh, you can see the, the build uh, not um, finished, but the people in the community, um, uh, uh, how do you say, Hopi community in, uh, in Senegal. So we always working, we keep working with these people. Now is the build uh, finish. Um, and the, we had uh, uh, David and uh, Joy with us. I think it was uh, 
2007 or 18, something like that. Um, and uh, another, so uh, if we win in God, we will have the, the first uh, graduation the, for two groups uh, in July, next July. So I hope I, I will uh, be there also. So it's the last time I was presentially with them. Uh, since it is time, I am teaching them on online. So it is working very well. So as I, I know the language, I, I know the, the culture. So it, it works very well. So until now, even the new, uh, for example, the new, the new group I, I, am, I am teaching now, I know where they are from, I know what they do, so we can share about the uh, uh, word, is, it works very well, the Bible Institute. As you know also, the, before the pandemic time arrived, we was helping the church in Brazil, our home church. So uh, it was a good time to, um, how do you say in English, uh, rebuild the, the church. So they, they had uh, many problems. So it was very good. It is working very well. So the, the pictures you are seeing is uh, the last two years we are doing that and uh, helping the, our church and the, uh, rebuild also the, the elders of church. So God thanks God for this time. So now you can see in uh, in the Africa Africa's map map uh, where we are working Senegal uh, here and the Burkina we are just to help uh, uh, a couple uh, that uh, is from Burkina and then they are training with us in Senegal here uh, five days of bus of bus for arrive and then they will come back to Burkina to plant in church and uh, between uh, another people uh, Nuni is a unreached, unreached people group so we are working in San Tomé e Príncipe is two islands here in Atlantic Ocean Ocean and Mozambique we, we are developing something there and Angola for next time so this is picture of uh, from San Tomé. We have a partnership with the IMB and the WEC International, Mozambique. Sorry for sorry for Portuguese words here, no? but uh, uh, one mission um, society. Now we had uh, also a, a partnership there. And Burkina, this is the couple, Elise and Ebie. So they, uh, his father worked with us in Senegal telling story. He came from Burkina, and now he, he sent uh, his son just for finish the, uh, his uh, training, the theological training. So, well. What will you be uh, doing in Angola? So, we always work with the centrality uh, of God's, God's work, God's word, sorry, uh, evangelism and discipleship, uh, healthy church and leadership development. And the word is uh, the form of appropriate for all the peoples and languages of Angola. You know, uh, our final vision is uh, the unreached people group and engaged unreached people group. So, uh, here we have the names of uh, 11 groups in Angola that are unreached. Uh, engaged uh, uh, is still. So, I, I ask you to pray for them and to pray for us, and also we are thanking you, uh, saying thank you for your support, 
uh, uh, to be together us in this new uh, challenge. Okay. If you if you have the, if you have questions, I'm glad to talk with you uh, after service. Thank you, brothers and sisters. Thank you, Eric. So we are in the book of Acts right now in our Sunday school, looking at the ways that the gospel has gone from Jerusalem to Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And so this morning we asked the question, what would it be like if the mission had stopped right there in Jerusalem? Uh, if, if the church had chosen not to go beyond those walls? Well, we're standing here today in an Anglo church in America, hearing from a Brazilian brother who's ministering to Fulani Muslims in Africa. And this is the beauty of the gospel at work. And so, folks, there is good reason for us just to rejoice in God's faithfulness and His goodness and the ways He continues to do His work among His people. We are thankful for you. Uh, you have given us a list of peoples that we can pray for, and maybe we'll get that list and put that out somehow. If anybody wants to do that, we'll post it on the bulletins board or something. What about uh, personally? How can we be praying for your family as you get ready to head to Angola? Yes. First, Charlie, have the, the just, mm -hmm. just to start now to ask the visas, and uh, then we we will have a new a new how do you say adaptation mm -hmm. in the country, and uh, so is the challenge is to to learn new language, maybe one language or more. No, but anyway, we uh, I will have many, many uh, requests yeah. for priests. Right. <laughs> Curiosity, how many languages do you speak? Um, I think five or six. Uh, okay. <laughs> so this is... Uh, if you if you consider it, I speak English. <laughs> I'm not sure. <laughs> good enough, good enough. <laughs> well, brother, before you, before you step down, we want to pray for you. James, you want to come up and just, uh, we'll take a moment and pray for you and we'll pray for your family. And uh, we'll, uh, we're, we're thankful, though, for you. Father, thank you for allowing us to, to serve you and helping us understand that your gospel is local, is personal. It's also very global. I pray that's a mindset that we would have, God, that we would understand how we support uh, missions across the world, and that we would be excited about that. I pray that you would remind us consistently to pray for souls across the globe, to pray for Celso and his family as they are boots on the ground, doing your work, taking your gospel to people who have never heard it before, taking your gospel and discipling people that are on the ground already how to share the gospel. Now, we're so thankful for them and their family and the influence that they've had on us and the friendships that we built with them. But more than anything, God, we pray that you would, you would use us and give us discernment to know how to most effectively minister your gospel, both here and globally. We praise things in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Brother. thinking as we're going through that slideshow and showing those pictures of the, the stones that now line the path, uh, each one associated with a story. And I, you can't help but think of in the Old Testament when God's people were told, hey, put up a memorial here, set a stone, and one day your children are going to ask you, what do those stones mean, right? And to have the opportunity to be able to just declare the goodness and the glory of God. What a wonderful thing. Well, I could in the morning, hearing more about that, but we are gathered together as God's people to worship Him, and important to that is that we spend some time together in His Word. So I want to invite you to turn with me to Philippians chapter 2, Philippians chapter 2. I'll, I'll try to be gracious this morning, we'll go, we'll go easy on you. Been here a little while, and uh, we'll try not to go too long today, but uh, 
we'll, we'll see what, uh, what the Lord has for us as we go forward in His Word. We're in Philippians chapter 2. I'm going to read this morning verses 1 through 11. Uh, we're not going to get through all of this. I can guarantee you that, but we will begin. Philippians chapter 2, verses 1 through 11. All right, so if there is any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourself. Let each of you look not only to his own interest, but also to the interest of others. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant. Being born in the likeness of men and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord for the glory of God the Father. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for the joy that we have shared already together this morning. As we gathered in small groups around your word in our Sunday school classes and uh, just God took note of the way that the gospel was going to the nations and then to be able to gather here and to sing of the way that your gospel promises have come to us and then to hear from one of your servants how the gospel is indeed going to the nations even in our day. That we are grateful for the reminder that, that your work is not done. That you are still moving among your people. That there are still many who have never heard. And that we have a job to do as your people to take the gospel to the ends of the earth. So we rejoice this morning with Celso and Andrea and the work that they are doing for your kingdom. We rejoice that we have the opportunity to be partners in that work and to help support them with our love and with our prayers and with our financial gifts. And God, I pray that we would find joy in partnering, not just from a distance, but God, as you open doors, would you take us as well from within this body to the nation. Thank you for your word. Thank you for the calling that you give us in the scripture today and for the example that we have in your son, Jesus Christ. It's in his name that we pray. Amen. So in verse 27 of chapter 1, Paul speaks of the importance of unity in the church. He's telling us that we ought to let our manner of life be worthy of the gospel. And as a part of that, he says that his hope is that whether he is able to come and be with the Philippian church or whether he only hears testimony about them from afar, he wants to hear that they are standing firm in one spirit, with one mind, striving side by side for the faith of the gospel. Unity is a common theme in Paul's writings. Uh, matter of fact, in every one of his letters to the churches, he addresses it in one way or another. Um, to the Romans, he wrote this. He said, May the God of endurance and encouragement grant you to live in such harmony with one another in accord with Christ Jesus, that together you may with one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, welcome one another as Christ has welcomed you for the glory of God. To the Corinthians, he wrote, I appeal to you, brothers, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be united in the same mind and the same judgment. 
to the Ephesians. And this is a passage that we read last week also. He says, I therefore, a prisoner of the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called. Very similar to the command in chapter 1 of Philippians. With all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. For there is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to one hope that belongs to your call, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. I have more references here, but we'll, we'll move past some of those for the sake of time. But Paul, obviously, very concerned about the unity of the church. Jesus shared a similar concern. You, you will know that in the Gospels, he spoke on more than one occasion about how Christians would be known, how? By their love for one another. And so he calls the people of God to be at peace. And before his death, when he was praying in the garden, John chapter 17, he prayed this. He said, I do not ask for these only, meaning his current followers, those who had come to faith during his earthly ministry, but also for those who will believe in me through their word, that they may all be one, just as you, Father, are in me, and I in you, that they also may be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. So Jesus wanted the church to be united as one in the same way that he was one with the Father. And notice what he says there. As God's people are united around the gospel, what happened? The world is watching, we see. And Jesus prays that through our testimony, the world would believe that the gospel is true because they see its power at work in us. Christian unity was important to Paul. It was important to Jesus. It's an important part of the church's gospel witness. We can ask the question, what is true Christian unity? What does it look like? And where does it come from? Now, depending upon who you ask, you could get a lot of different answers for that. Some believe that unity is simply going along to get along. You've heard that phrase before. Let people think what they want, do what they want, believe what they want, behave what they want. Don't worry about it. You never question. You never challenge. You never correct. You never rebuke. You place no expectations. Just love each other. And everything will work out. You heard that before. But that's not unity. At least not as the Bible describes it. Love itself has to be defined, right? Love is rooted in truth. Paul says that back in chapter 1. He wants the love of these believers to abound with what? Knowledge and discernment. So, so we can't just say, hey, everybody just get along. For one thing, that won't work. You ever try that with your kids? Just get along with each other. Stop fighting. Miraculous. They just all line right out. It doesn't work that way. You can't just say it and assume that it's going to be so. And you can't just overlook everything and hope that we're all going to get things together. Unity requires that we have something that we are united around. And true Christian unity then is centered around Christian truth. If we're going to be united together as God's people, then we've, we've got to unite around the truth of the gospel. We've got to faithfully confess the gospel. And we have to submit ourselves to the gospel and all of its implications that we find laid out in the Scripture. It requires that we hold God's Word in high esteem and let it be our guide for faith and practice. It requires, as we'll see here in Philippians chapter 2, we've already read that we take upon ourselves the mind of Christ and seek to be like Him. If we're not doing these things, then we can't really have true Christian unity. I think it's useful to acknowledge that so often when we think about unity in all areas of our lives, but, but also in the church, our temptation is to make unity about other people being conformed to us. You understand that? Here's how we're going to get along. You're going to decide that I'm right. And you're going to think the way that I think. And you're going to act the way that I act. You're going to do the things that I do. 
That so often is how we approach this idea of unity. Essentially, what we're doing is we're asking people to cater to us, to our needs, to our expectations. And if they won't, then well, we just can't get along. It's just not going to work. That's not the way things are meant to work within the church. See, this is another thing. When we talk about unity in the body of Christ, it, it can't be about us somehow being conformed to each other. This is not just about you submitting to me or me submitting to you so that one of us gives in and everything's okay. To truly be united in the faith, we have to be conformed not to one another, but to the image of God's Son. That's God's will for us, right? That we be conformed to the image of His Son. That's why He's called us. That's why He set us apart. That's why He's redeemed us and given us promises for the future. And so, when we have concerns about disruptions in the church, when there's a lack of unity in the body of Christ, our first thought should not be about everybody else getting it together and getting in line. Our first thoughts have to be about ourselves. Examining where it is that we are failing to be conformed into the image of Christ, where it is that we are failing to love the way that we should, and thinking of how can we can better take upon ourselves the mind of Christ and be more like Him. John MacArthur gives a helpful definition when he speaks of Christian unity. He says this, the unity that the Word so highly exalts is inward, not outward. It is internally desired, not externally compelled. It is spiritual, not ecclesiastical, more heartfelt than creedal. It is not grounded in sentimentalism, but in careful, thoughtful, and determined obedience to God's will. It is the spirit-motivated and spirit-empowered bonding of the heart, minds, and souls of God's children to each other. So this is something that comes about as God works in us as individuals. Thinking on these same lines, Warren Wiersbe points out usefully that there is a difference between unity and uniformity. I think that's important for us to note too. He says true spiritual unity comes from within. It's a matter of the heart. Uniformity, on the other hand, is the, pressure, is the result of pressure from without. This unity is a spiritual problem. It can't be solved by rules or threats. It's going to be solved when our hearts are right with Christ and with each other. Unity, not uniformity. And we understand we're, we're not always going to agree on everything. We're, we're going to have different ideas. And sometimes those ideas can both be good, right? But we have to determine how are we going to live together and move forward together. And that means that we are laying our hearts before the Lord. So perhaps you've heard that prayer before. Lord, send revival. Start with me. Well, we can also pray, Lord, unite your people. And start with me. So Paul helps us here in Philippians chapter 2 to know how we can devote ourselves to the cause of Christian unity. I think this is useful. Because it's one thing to talk about unity as it's some random term out there and, and, and to talk about how we should pursue unity or how important it is that we're united. We can even talk about the importance of self-examination and dealing with our own sins before we try to deal with anyone else's. What does that really look like? What are, what are some practical things that we can do to help us get there? And that's where we're going to focus our time this morning. I plan to look at verses 1 through 4. I'm doubtful we're going to finish all of that. But we'll consider some of these practical things that we can do in the pursuit of unity in the body of Christ. There are a few things that we see. And the first one is this. As we are seeking to be united to our brothers and sisters in the Lord, a good place for us to start is to remember the kindness that God has shown to us. Look at verse 1 there. He says, So if there is any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, 
any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy. We'll stop there. Paul begins this chapter with that word, so. Your translation may use the word, therefore. And so, in light of what has been said before, pointing us back to the joy that he has in the gospel, the, the hopes he has for the church, and this challenge to live in a manner that's worthy of the gospel of Christ. In light of all that, then, here are some things we ought to do. So he uses that conjunction there. So, so, so is pointing us back, but he uses that conjunction if, then, to point us forward. So in light of the command to live in a manner worthy of the gospel, here's what you ought to do. But there are some conditions that are placed here. He uses that word if, pointing us specifically to certain realities of what it means to know and be known by God. In other words, if you really are a child of God, if you have experienced His mercies, then you're going to live in a manner worthy of the gospel. And you're going to seek unity with your brothers and sisters. He talks about things that we have received from God. Encouragement in Christ. Comfort from love. Participation in the Spirit. Affection and sympathy. If we have those things, then God's commands are for us. Kent Hughes in his commentary on Philippians refers to these four phrases in verse 1 as fourfold motivations for Christian unity. These four phrases call on us to remember what happened when we came to know Jesus as Savior and Lord. When God transformed our lives, these are things that we received from Him. And as a result, they help motivate us forward toward walking in unity with our brothers and sisters in the faith as we follow Christ's example. So I want to look at these things individually here. First, Paul writes about the encouragement that we have in Christ. If, if there is any encouragement in Christ, he uses that word encouragement, and that word for encouragement is so much more than just a spiritual at a boy or at a girl. This is not just a pat on the back where Jesus said, hey, great job. This is not really the, 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 the message that we're getting here. That word for encouragement is a word that refers to to being brought near, to being taught, to being consoled, to being comforted, to being given rest. The word that was used by the Jews to describe the work that the Messiah was going to do when He came into the world. You remember Luke chapter 2, when Jesus is presented at the temple, and there's that man Simeon who's ministering in the temple, and we're told that he was a man righteous and devout, waiting for what? The consolation of Israel. That's the same word that's in play here when we talk about the encouragement that we receive from Christ. So this word tells the story of our redemption. And it gives us this beautiful picture of God's mercy poured out on us. You think about all that that word entails. Think about your life before you came to faith. When you were lost, you didn't know Jesus. And the way that God's grace came and transformed you. Or, or think about how in your life, in your walk with Christ through the years, you've been following Him, but you know that you still struggle with your sin. But every time you're fighting these battles against sin, God comes and offers you that continuing encouragement. Think about all that word means. When you were far from God, He brought you near. That's encouragement from Christ. When you were ignorant, when you were uninformed, you didn't understand the things of God, God came and He taught you. That's encouragement from Christ. When your heart was broken, crushed under the weight of your sin, He came and He consoled you. you peace. That's encouragement from Christ. When you were afflicted, He gave you comfort. When you were weary, He gave you rest. When you were perishing, He rescued you. And He gave you new and lasting eternal life. That is what it means to have encouragement in Christ. 
have we received incredible mercy from God in Christ? If so, and I think this is the point that Paul is making here, should we not then be merciful toward others? See, that's the way that God has dealt with us. And that's how He calls us to deal with those around us. So as those who have been encouraged through the work of Christ in our lives, we are called then to encourage. There's any encouragement in Christ, and then he says, if there is any comfort from love. That word for comfort, it's, it's similar to the word encouragement. Literally, it means speaking closely with someone. It, it, it calls up that idea of intimacy. It, it points us to a, a loving relationship that helps to bring us peace. When your heart's broken, what do you do? You go to the people that you love. They'll put their arm around you. They'll hold you close. They'll remind you of their love for you. And they bring you comfort. That's the idea that's at work here. The way that God pours His love into us. Romans chapter 5 gives a good, a good example of this. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through Him we have obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand, and we receive in hope of the glory of God. Not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope, and hope does not put us to shame, because God's love has been poured into our heart through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. For while we were still weak, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would dare even to die. But God shows His love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. This is the gospel that brings us peace. We have received tremendous comfort from God's love. So what do you think God would have us to do to those around us to comfort them with His love. So if there's any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, and then He says, any participation in the Spirit. That word participation comes from the Greek word koinonia. You know that word. The word that is typically translated as fellowship paints a picture of intimate communion where we share together in all things. So in saving us, God fills us with His Holy Spirit, and through the Holy Spirit, He dwells with us intimately. He teaches and He instructs. He guides and He directs. He exhorts and admonishes. He disciplines and corrects. And He's pouring out into our lives, day after day, a never-ending supply of His mercy and grace. As believers, we have fellowship with God through the Holy Spirit. It is the Holy Spirit that brings us to life in the first place so that we can even know God. And the fellowship that we have with God through His Spirit is meant to be reflected in the fellowship that we have with one another. Think about that early church. We're studying through Acts. Acts chapter 2. They had all things in common, right? Every day, they were together, worshiping in the synagogue, in the temple, going into each other's homes, sharing their meals, and giving sacrificially to care for their brothers and sisters. That's what fellowship looks like within the church. So if we have fellowship with God through the Spirit, we ought to reflect that in the fellowship we have with others. Holding all things in common, giving generously, meeting needs both physical and spiritual. And fourth, Paul writes there about affection and sympathy. These words refer to the tender mercies and compassions of God that He shows to those that He loves. They remind us of how God, who is good and kind, 
looked on us when we were lost and broken and was moved deeply. That word for affection, we talked about this uh, back in chapter 1 early on. Remember when Paul says that I'm yearning for you with the affections of Christ? And that, that word affection, that splachna, uh, literally referring to the bowels, like deep down in the gut, there is this, this feeling that arises, that, that stirs this, this great mercy and compassion. That's the idea here. That God looks on us in our sin and He is moved and He has mercy on us. Affection and sympathy. Think of the story of the Good Samaritan in Luke chapter 10. The man who's beaten by robbers and he's left for dead. He's overlooked by everyone who should have cared for him. We read in Luke chapter 10, verse 33, that this Samaritan, when he saw him, he had compassion. That same word refers to the gut. He was stirred deep within to say, this man needs care. This man needs love. This man needs provision. He needs a rescue. And I'm going to give that to him. Same word we find here in Philippians chapter 2 when he speaks of affection. The tender mercies and the compassion of God, affection and sympathy that are given to us when we are at our worst, lost, headed for hell, dead in our sins. God comes to us and He gives us life. Don't deserve it. He gives it to us nonetheless. That's the affection and sympathy, the tender mercy, the compassion of God being poured out on us. And how do you think then God would have us to respond to others? The church at Philippi, we have to remember, was in the midst of a dispute. For all the good things that Paul heard when Epaphroditus came to him and told him of the wonderful things that God was doing in Philippi and the way that he was moving in the church and strengthening the, the disciples, he also brought word of a problem. There was a dispute in the church that was leading to division within the church. You have those two women who were both revered in the congregation who had obviously come to some sort of disagreement. We don't know what that disagreement was. But we know that there was a disagreement among these prominent women that was beginning to drive a wedge between other believers within the church. They are entreated in chapter 4, verse 2, to agree in the Lord, to put aside their differences, to let their reasonableness be known to all, because the Lord was at hand. They had labored side by side with Paul in gospel ministry, and he's calling them to continue doing the same. Now, these are faithful women. They've been faithful in service to the gospel, so odds are, Whatever they were fighting about, it wasn't some deep spiritual problem. There probably wasn't some terrible doctrinal thing happening. But we know that sometimes disputes arise among us, right? God calls us to peace. And so he's writing to these Philippians to be united in the faith, to lay aside that division and get back on the same page. And he tells them how they can get started in that process. I wonder... How would things look different in our lives, in this church, in churches that are scattered across the land and around the world? If we dealt with each other the way that God has dealt with us. Think about that. When we come to points where we don't necessarily see eye to eye, when somebody hurts us in one way or another, when we have disagreements over certain things that maybe aren't the most important things, but nonetheless. If when we came to those points where we felt like we were a little bit at odds with each other, what would it look like if we dealt with each other the way that God has dealt with us? Well, what Paul is saying to these believers is, look, understand here, I'm calling you to, to get together. Verse 2, completing my joy, being of the same mind, having the same love, being of full accord in one mind. I'm calling you to do that, but here's a good place for you to start. Do you remember what God has done for you in Christ? Do you remember what He did for you when you were lost? How He brought you near to Himself and gave you consoling and comforting and He taught you and He, he just tied you in intimately to Himself. He made you His child. He 
brought you encouragement in Christ, as He comforted you with His love, letting you know that your sins were forgiven and you were united to Him and He was with you every step of the way. When He brought you fellowship with Him through the Holy Spirit, united you with Him, gave you full access, never shut you out or turned you away. As He poured out His affection, His sympathy, His tender mercies and compassions. Remember how God has worked in you? What if we were to treat each other the same way? It's so important sometimes that we recognize when we have struggles and strife, when disputes rise among us, so often there are many other things that underlie that. There are other struggles beyond the, under the surface. There are ways that our brothers and sisters are hurting. And if we could say to them, rather than being angry or upset or stirring up some sort of division, look, I've been there. And God has been merciful to me. I've been there and God has loved me through it. I've been there and God has just brought me closer through His Holy Spirit. I've been there. God has poured out His mercy and compassion on me. And so I want to offer the same to you. That's where He's taking us on this journey when He's telling us to take upon ourselves the mind of Christ. Not to act out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but to put others ahead of ourselves. It comes from acknowledging what God has done to us. And as people who have received many great and wonderful, gracious gifts from God. Extending those gifts out to one another. That's verse 1. Tell you what, let's, let's stop there today. I think it's a good word for us. As we were reminded of, of how God has been so gracious to us, I've often said as people who confess the doctrines of grace, sometimes we're not very good at showing grace to others, are we? I, I think there's a lesson for us to learn here. We, we consider the ways that God has poured out His mercy on us. If we truly call that to mind, that will change the way that we deal with each other. We will recognize that we are sinners who need mercy and we are dealing with sinners who need mercy. And if we understand that together and we're walking together in pursuit of Christ, it changes a lot. We'll talk more on this topic next week when we gather. We'll stop there for today. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for the mercies you have poured out on us. For the encouragement that we have in Christ for the comfort of His love, for the fellowship that we have through the Holy Spirit, through the affection and the sympathy that is ours every day as You pour out Your love upon us. We thank You for the gracious ways that You have dealt with us. And God, I pray that You would help us as we're going to see moving forward in this passage to humble ourselves and to offer those mercies to those around us. Help us as husbands and wives to offer that mercy to our spouses. Help us as parents to offer that mercy to our children. Help our children to offer that mercy to us because we need it far more than we're willing to admit. Within this faith family, would you help us to extend these mercies to one another as we remember what you have done for us. God, we thank you for your word. We rejoice in your work of salvation and the way that you are continuing that saving work throughout the nations in this day. So we thank you that we can rejoice together in that and celebrate with our brother and sister who are here and that we get to participate in that work. God, be glorified in us as individuals and as a church. We pray in Christ. Y'all have a great day.